How do we go from dial-up to the high-speed internet that we have today? Better yet, how do we even get to dial-up? Let's start there. We're gonna take it all the way back to the year 1837. At this point, the first battery had already been invented, which allows scientists to manually produce electricity for the first time. They were specifically excited about this new discovery called electromagnetism, which proved that magnets can create electricity and electricity can create magnets. Scientists in both the US and Britain we're working on this new technology that would eventually become the foundation of how we communicate digitally today. But it was a man in New York City named Samuel Morse that would make it well known. It was called the telegraph. It was a simple device that carried pulses of electricity over a wire. At one end of the wire was a transmitter. It had a battery to power it and a lever. So when the lever was pushed down, it would send a steady flow of electricity through the wire. And when the lever was lifted up, it would stop the flow of electricity through the wire. On the other side of the wire was the receiver. The receiver had a long scroll of paper attached to it. Imagine it like a receipt printer. It also had an ink roller attached to a lever. When that lever was forced down, the ink roller would leave streaks of ink on the paper. When the electric pulses that were flowing through the wire from the transmitter finally hit the receiver, those electric pulses would interact with an electromagnet. What we know about electromagnetism is that magnets can create electricity and electricity can create magnets. Electromagnets allow that conversion to happen. They're essentially just a piece of metal, usually iron or steel, wrapped in a copper wire. When those electric pulses flow through the copper wire, it magnetizes the electromagnet. That magnetic force pulls the lever with the ink roller onto the paper, and the lever stays down for however many seconds long the pulse is. So if the person at the transmitter held the lever down for two seconds, the ink roller at the receiver will be held down for two seconds. The length of the electricity pulse and therefore the length of the dots and dashes were used to represent certain letters and numbers that we know today as Morse code, named after Samuel Morris himself. And even though they look close together in this diagram, in real life, the transmitter and the receiver could be in two different buildings hundreds of miles away. The wire that connected them were actually miles long cables that were held up by utility poles. This was the first time electricity was directly used to send messages over long distances. Before that, they mostly relied on messengers on horseback or stagecoaches. So everyone loves this new telegraph. They start running cables everywhere, like utility poles all over the place. They were built all across the US, Europe, and even ran cables on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean to connect the two. So everything's all great, and then boom, something better happens. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone after he learned how to convert sound waves to electromagnetic waves. For sound specifically, these type of waves are called audio signal. To create the microphone part of the phone, he used a little flexible piece called a diaphragm. When sound, which is basically just a vibration of air particles, hit the diaphragm, the diaphragm would interact with a magnet that had a wire coiled around it. The louder the noise, the bigger the vibration, and therefore the further the magnet would move. And because of electromagnetism, moving a magnet through the wire caused more or less electricity to run through the wire, depending on how fast the magnet is moving. And because the microphone of the phone works this way, the speaker would work in the exact opposite way by converting audio signals back to a sound. It also uses a magnet that's wrapped in wire. And so when the magnet moves, it pushes air back to our ears, which we interpret as sound. So this all made telephones very popular and quickly made telegraphs nearly obsolete. New telephone lines either ended up replacing or sitting side by side with telegraph lines. People preferred phones because instead of having to learn Morse code, they could just talk to each other instantly and even over a long distance just using their voice, which duh, right? That's how phones worked all of our lives. But it was revolutionary at that point. Anyways, with the popularity of the telephone and the advancements in electricity, by 1960, 80% of US households had phones. And at the same time, the internet was just starting to be developed. At this point, computers had been around for years, but mainly used by governments, universities, and big corporations. And even though they had gotten smaller over the years as technology improved, they were still really big and clunky. The personal computer, which for most of us was our first introduction to computers in general, wasn't really available yet for the general public. The computers that did exist at these large organizations worked in silos. There wasn't a way for a computer at company A to communicate with a computer at company B. Though within their silos, they were able to have all their computers in their own network communicate and share data with each other. These are called LANs or local area networks. So the US government was one of these organizations that had their own networks. 
During the 60s, while the Cold War was still going on, the Department of Defense started to become concerned about their network being attacked. They wanted to decentralize their network so that if someone were to attack it, they would never be able to take down the entire network. At the same time, there was also the desire to connect colleges and universities around the country so that students and professors could share knowledge more easily. So there was clearly a need to develop a way for different networks to communicate and share data. The DOD had recently created ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, to support the research and development of new technologies that could support the military. ARPA ended up creating what was known as ARPANET, the first wide area network that successfully connected some of these siloed networks together. The first connection between two different computers of two different networks was between Stanford and UCLA in 1969. And wanna know how they're able to send data from Stanford all the way to UCLA? They use telephone lines. Why? Because they're already everywhere. The infrastructure was already set up. Engineers figured out how to convert digital computer data, which can only ever be in two states, usually represented by ones and zeros, into audio signals and vice versa. Unlike digital data, audio signals can have a range of states and is not binary like digital data. They were able to convert these back and forth using modems, the same type of modems that we use today. Modem is literally short for modulator demodulator. So their job is simply to modulate digital data, AKA turn it into an audio signal or demodulate the audio signal, AKA turn it back into digital. This is how they were able to connect computers and different networks over a telephone line that only understood audio signals. So over the next two decades, ARPA continued to grow while other wide area networks start to spread across the US. But it wasn't until 1983 where a standard communication protocol known as TCP IP was created and allowed all these different networks to work together. And when they finally did, it became known as the internet. So all the internet really is, is a bunch of computers all over the world that are connected together. An important thing to keep in mind though, when the internet was first created, no one cared. People that understood technology, of course, were excited about it. But the general public not only hadn't really even heard about it, but also didn't really understand it or didn't know what it could be used for. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. It would really start catching on in 1991 after the creation of the World Wide Web. A lot of people think the internet and the World Wide Web are the same thing, but actually the World Wide Web is just a subset of the internet. The web brought us websites, visual and interactive pages on the internet that we could understand. The internet itself just allows us to share data with other computers. Email was actually invented well before the World Wide Web, but the web is what made the internet popular for everyday people that didn't understand technology. So while all of these developments were happening, personal computers were now becoming the new hot thing. People could now have computers in their own homes. It wasn't just for schools and businesses and governments anymore. By 2000, 40% of U.S. households had a personal computer in their home with access to internet. And how were these computers able to connect to the internet? The same way the computers at Stanford and UCLA did in 1969, through phone lines. So enter dial-up internet. Dial-up let people use their home phone lines to connect to the internet, which also meant that no one in the house could use the phone if someone else was connected to the internet. Just like in the 60s, modems were used to convert your computer's digital data to audio signals that could be sent through the phone line to your phone company, who are now becoming more known as internet service providers rather than phone companies. Internet service providers would provide a phone number for you to call to make a connection to the internet. But why does it sound like this? The short answer is that before you could start using the internet, the modem at your home had to first establish a connection with the modem at the internet service provider. This was called the dial-up modem handshake. It was essentially just two modems talking to each other and agreeing on a frequency and other communication settings. And remember, phone lines were originally designed to send audio signals. So we're able to hear the two modems communicate in the same way that we would hear two people communicating. Modems just speak in dial tones. But as you know, we've come a long way from dial-up. By 2007, 50% of US households have switched to broadband internet, which is much faster than dial-up because it sends digital data directly over the wire rather than audio signals. The two most popular types of broadband internet are cable internet, which is provided by your cable company, and DSL, which is still provided by your phone company. The connection for cable internet runs through your coaxial cable port, then splits, where one port is connected to your cable box and the other port is connected to your modem. DSL, on the other hand, still uses the phone line, but in contrast to dial-up, it doesn't take over the whole line. Part of the wire is dedicated for phone calls, while the rest is dedicated to providing internet service, which means with DSL, 
you can use your home phone and still have really fast internet. The majority of people still use either DSL or cable internet today. Though now fiber optic internet is close to surpassing both of them. It was introduced commercially a little bit after broadband started hitting homes. Verizon Files was one of the first major companies to provide it starting in 2005. Fiber optic internet can be much faster than broadband. And unlike the telegraph and the telephone and dial up and broadband internet, it sends data through flashes of light rather than electricity. This, in addition to the fact that the light travels through a really thin fiberglass, is what gives it its speed. But the issue is, the cost to lay new fiber optic cables is relatively high. And a lot of times it's only worth it if it's done in really densely populated areas where there will be enough customers to offset the cost. So here we are.